Welcome to Hedge Fund Tips with Tom Hayes. I'm Tom Hayes and this is Videocast 112 and Podcast 102 for the week ending December 9th, 2021. So want to kick it off with the media spots this week and then we'll get right down to it. We've got a lot to uh, cover and uh, quite a bunch of good stuff this week. So I uh, want to thank Devik Jain and Bansari Mayur Kamdar for including me in their articles on Reuters. Uh, I guess this was uh, right after the jobs report and, uh, and, and my comments were related to you know, wh whether or not it affects the Fed decision uh, next week as to whether to accelerate the taper or not. It seems like a foregone conclusion that they want to move ahead. We'll see. We're going to dig into that this week uh, as to what the market is telling us so far. Uh, and then also earlier this week, I want to thank uh, Bansari Mayor Kamdar for including me. This was about uh, Trump's SPAC, uh, DWAC. He raised a billion dollar in capital. And I was commenting, you know, it was up at the time. Uh, and people were wondering, you know, what are they going to buy? How are they going to use the cash, et cetera, et cetera. And then uh, our quote of the day for this week is going to be Warren Buffett. Opportunities come in frequently when it rains gold. Put out the bucket, not the thimble. And we had a little taste of that in the last couple of weeks with the Om Omicron scare. Uh, and we'll talk about some opportunities uh, this week. So I want to start with this note from uh, Citi. This was Goldman CEO uh, uh, David Solomon, a.k.a. DJ Saul, who likes to uh, uh, DJ at the nightclubs as, as his side gig when he's not running Goldman Sachs. Uh, and he said that uh, policy, not the pandemic, is the biz biggest risk ahead for the markets. There's no question about that. And I think we're going to get a taste of that next week with how they deal with uh, the speed of taper uh, and how they deal with uh, you know, near term above t above trend inflation. Uh, as it relates to inflation, you see Joe Manchin uh, is says he's uh, fed up with Biden's spending plans. He's the Democratic senator from West Virginia. Quote: We've done everything we can do to help the people, and he's walking around with this card in his pocket. Um, uh, listing all the things that he feels Democrats have done for the country. And he says, um, you know, it's plenty. The Democrats should talk about it more. And he says, since March 20th, Congress has provided $5.4 trillion in response to the COVID-19 pandemic. In addition, Congress provided another $1.2 trillion through the Historic Bipartisan Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act. That's $6.6 .6 trillion. Congress has already provided above and beyond annual appropriations for the past 20 months. As a reminder for context, the Marshall Plan was equal to $151 billion adjusted for inflation. That's in today's dollars. And World War II, the total spend was $4.5 trillion adjusted for inflation. And here we are at $6.6 .6 trillion. Uh, so that's, uh, that's quite a bit. And now that, you know, they're, they've got uh, $1.9 trillion that they're trying to uh, push through for the social spending plan. Um, so that's that, and he, he lists that out. So so that's interesting from an inflation standpoint, because as we've covered in recent weeks, we, uh, we've we seen most of the commodity basket from grains to metals to uh, uh, the energy complex to lumber to all these different things roll over, and consumers will start to feel that on a lag basis. Tomorrow's CPI numbers are probably the most important data print before the Fed meets. Um, if you look at... Uh, wage growth uh, came, came in a less than expected in the jobs report last week, so that was positive because that's uh, and you know that's the sticky part of inflation. So the CPI numbers, uh, you know, I'm not sure where they're going to come in tomorrow. Um, you have seen commodities roll over, but to to be seen in end products, it might be a little early. And as a matter of fact. I talk about in the article of the week them fighting yesterday's battle. You know, prices were very high three months ago. Wages kept going up three months ago. That's starting to cool off. And the um, supply chain was a huge problem uh, in, in the past couple of months. And that's starting to loosen up as well. So, you know, will they have the foresight to think, wow, 
okay, all of this is now normalizing. Do we respond to what it was three months ago at its worst and accelerate too quickly? Or do we say, no, we were probably right on most of these things and they are going to stop, stop going up at, at the same pace and, and start to normalize. Uh, maybe we should just do the normal taper path that we had originally laid out of six to seven months uh, through June, which would be add another $600 billion of liquidity to the system while you're uh, starting to wind things down. Uh, that seems to be lower probability. The market seems 100% convinced that they're moving ahead with accelerated taper by March, and the market is pricing in three rate hikes uh, for 2022, uh, starting as, as potentially as early as, as March, um, which would be 75 basis points for the year. Uh, I think that's going to be a lot, and, and we'll cover and, and why. Uh, I also think if Manchin does hold his ground on this, which is pretty bold considering the number of people receiving benefits in West Virginia through some of these plans, um, that could also give the Fed a little bit of cover to not move so fast if this $1.9 trillion of, of spend is, is, uh, is going to be delayed or, or, um, or not passed. So uh, we'll, we'll have to see how that plays out. Uh, so Manchin won't pledge to support Biden's spending bill. Uh, quote, the unknown we're facing today is much greater than the need that people believe this aspirational bill that we're looking at. We got to make sure we get this right. We just can't continue to flood the market as we've done, uh, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, there's no immediate danger to triple B if it does not fact passed before Christmas, but there is a prospect of attrition as bits get picked off during the eight week stretch from mid-December to mid-February uh, was written by uh, an analyst uh, responding to that news. Fed, Fed officials are planning to want this from the Wall Street Journal, planning to wind down a bond buying program sooner than a goal set just weeks ago, a shift that opens the door for the central bank to raise rates in the spring rather than later in the year to curb inflation. Uh, and, um, you know, we, we covered what the market's pricing in at the moment. Uh, what scares the market more than COVID? The Federal Reserve. Uh, this is from Barron's. Same, same type of theme here. Uh, and, you know, there's no question that, you know, the market had to sell off. Uh, you had the Omicron news on uh, Friday after Thanksgiving when trading uh, was pretty light, although the volume by the end of the day did pick up uh, uh, in fear. Um, a lot of professionals weren't at their desk and probably had to, you know, get get set up and, and get on it by the end of the trading day. Um, but you also saw in in Powell's testimony on the following Tuesday and Wednesday that that really impacted the market. You know, he went from a guy who had spent the last year convincing the world that inflation was transitory and within seconds after he was reappointed, all of a sudden he turns into Paul Volcker. Inflation is permanent and, uh, you know, he needs to uh, to act quickly. It, it uh, took, took the markets by surprise for sure. Um, Morgan Stanley sees the Fed as a greater threat to stocks than Omicron. I think that, you know, the biggest effect that the speed at which the Fed tightens is, is, is going to be less on our 2022 outlook of high single digits to low double digits with a lot of volatility in 2022. Uh, that is uh, returns for the S&P 500 high single digits to low double digits. And I think it's going to be more on which sectors will outperform. So uh, in theory, if they are accelerating the taper and, uh, and, and which means, you know, rate rises are going to come quicker. Uh, they're they're going to be out of the market of buying the long end of the curve uh, quickly. Uh, in theory, the biggest beneficiaries of that a rising rate environment, uh, uh, should be cyclicals in value. We have not seen that manifest in the market. So while there's this consensus that they're going to do it, you know, accelerate it and start rate hikes quickly, I think what's most likely 
next week is that they they potentially will accelerate it barring some really bad omicron news although you know the anecdotes out seem to be uh, more contagious much milder uh and not really affecting hospitalizations or, or deaths in a material way so far um i could see them accelerating the taper and making a meaningful concerted effort to say uh we explicitly have no intention to raise rates before the back half of next year even though the taper is going to end you know in march uh, we want to give it a few months to see how the market deals with the the lower levels of liquidity before we start raising and it is our view that uh, the earliest we would see raises is next summertime so that that's a way that they could effectively thread the needle um i will say that you know the jobs report was a relatively large miss so in some sense they could have cover but his testimony came after that data point uh i think tomorrow is going to be the most telling obviously if the cpi and core cpi comes in even though it's backward looking data and it doesn't take take into account the lagged effect until uh prices coming down and and uh the moderation of rate uh, wage increases uh is, is is felt in the market uh a hot number would certainly give them cover to accelerate the question is do they explicitly parse uh the distinction between rate, rate raises and uh uh accelerated taper that will be the key if they don't and they just say we're accelerating and if things look good we're going to raise right away uh that should hit uh tech long duration assets uh, long duration earnings assets because as that discount rate increases um the value of the future cash flows go goes down and that will disproportionately affect uh tech and and managers will start to look for um managers will start to look for for businesses that generate immediate cash banks energy industrials uh etc the laggards and and that seems to be the setup i mean if you look at earnings growth for next year uh industrials are expected to grow the fastest at 32.6 percent earnings growth relative to the s p at uh just under nine percent earnings growth and um and that would make make sense that that group would start start to outperform some of the laggards from this year which we love like boeing um like uh lockheed martin uh like some of the transports like uh you know southwest united airlines etc when, when all of that starts to normalize um there was an analyst uh from jp morgan kelly on the Liz, on the claim and countdown today and he said uh the carrying cost of crazy is zero <laughs> and I love that because I, I, I've said that when the cost of capital is, is zero, there's always malinvestment every cycle. And he was referring to crypto and he was referring to many of these stocks that have been hit lately uh, with, you know, price to sales multiples greater than 10 times, greater than 20 times, in some cases greater than 100 times and earning no money. And uh, and that's that exactly sums up where we are. The carrying cost of crazy is zero. and um that's going to change once once there's a cost to capital uh whether the rate rises start in march or they start in june or july uh the shift is going to start to look at those companies that can generate uh cash today and uh and have been have been relative laggards and and the returns of what's led uh the five or six stocks that have attributed i think um if you pull out the attribution, 70% of the gains in the S&P this year were attributable to six stocks, uh, which is basically FANG plus, plus NVIDIA, more or less. Um, so, so that's going to be the impact more than what it'll do to the general indices, because I think some of these laggards and lower weight sectors are going to really fly. So you'll have monster rallies under the surface, even if the index returns are relatively subdued uh than before what i want to do is is click over to the questions of the week ask me anything we've got a decent number of them john 
uh, John Croner comes out. Tom, thanks again for all the great wisdom that you share. My question is about ETF. Seems like everyone and their brother has one today. How do you rate them and when do you use them? Are they a good choice for part of a portfolio? Thank you. Uh, yeah, I mean, John, uh, you know, if they're 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 very tax efficient. Uh, so if you want to get like broad market or broad industry exposure quickly, you have the spiders. Like if you wanted to get industrial exposure for next year, for instance, and you didn't want to pick stocks, you could buy the XLI. If you wanted to uh, transports like FedEx and uh, some of the air carriers, I think are in IYT. Um, if you wanted to just have a balanced portfolio with, you know, U.S. and international, you know, the international have underperformed. They're trading at much lower valuations. The expectation is they may start to take the mantle next year. So you might want to have some like uh, XUS, like uh, VXUS. Uh, you might want to have some emerging markets, which we've spent a lot of time on and we're going to spend a little time on today. Uh, and you can do that very quickly, very uh in a, you know uh, cheaply and just and just mirror the indices you're not going to get massive alpha with them um but uh you know they they do have more and more active funds that what's interesting about it is the tax structure because you're buying the ticker and as long as you don't sell the ticker other than very nominal distributions and or dividend distributions all the trading that's going on under the surface you're not paying uh taxes on those short-term trades uh because of the uh creation and redemption baskets the way the way that it's structured is very tax efficient so um you know they're they're good products i mean relative to mutual funds i guess is what you what your comparison would be i think it's just a function of who's the manager and what are the returns uh net of fees and or if if you just want to use them to get broad market exposure it's an efficient way to do it sometimes you just want to quickly get sector exposure before you start picking the stocks it's an effective way to do it so uh so yeah there are plenty of uses uh for etfs um uh, even when generating alpha is like a placeholder uh biding time because you want to have money working you know uh all of the time and then and then as you get more granular you can replace out some of them with individual stocks etc cetera, etc cetera. um that that's how i do it again all of this is opinion not advice go to hedgefundtips.com click on uh terms and um, what i try to do each week is just share with you guys how i'm thinking how i'm doing which could be completely different from what's appropriate for your setup so always you know talk with a financial advisor based on your situation. I'm, I'm dealing exclusively with accredited investors, uh, very high net worth and qualified institutions. So it's it's a different game. Um, ben, first name only. Tom, your, hey Tom, short term thoughts on uh, IWM, which is the small caps and Apple, please. Thank you, Ben. Um, okay, so I would say, um, Small caps I like because, so well, I, all right, I've got the Apple chart here. So, you know, the thing with Apple, uh, Apple's fine. Obviously, it's a great company, et cetera, and it could keep, you know, slowly grinding up. Has a tendency every two years to um, breach its its 200-day moving average and, you know, basically cuts off a half to a third of its value very, very quickly, and then it resumes the uptrend. Um, you know, we're only about a year and a quarter in, uh, I'm sorry, a year and three quarters since it last breached the 200-day moving average. Um, the last time it took uh, uh, just over a year, the time before that, it took uh, about two full years before it breached, and then it, then it took off about a third of its value uh 2013 to 15 that was about a year, almost two years before it breached so there might be some room on this I, you know obviously the major gains are are out if if you look at um you know from trough to peak each of these cycles you know from 11 to 30 so uh 200 then from 21 to 56 uh, a little less than that, so you know, 170 percent. Then from uh, 40 to 80, so 100 percent. Now 52 to 
174, so it's up 200%. So this is this is getting on the higher end of, of its normal cyclical before it gives back a third and then resumes its uptrend. I mean, the company's fine, the business is doing well, maybe the, uh, the App Store thing is gonna start to affect earnings in future quarters, we'll see, but then they'll announce the car. So I, I just don't buy things up. So for me, this is not interesting. Uh, if it's in your portfolio, would, would I be rushing to the exits? Uh, probably not, I, I, th I think it's fine. It's like basically like owning the S&P here. Um, all right, next one was IWM, small caps. These should um, outperform in a rising rate environment. So they've been consolidating sideways since June, since uh, February, basically. They've done nothing. Um, and um, so it's basically gone sideways. I do think that small caps uh, could resume their uptrend if we start to see the rising rate environment. We're going to know a lot more after the fed meeting uh next week so but generally yeah i, I kind of like uh russell 2000 looking out the next three to six months um okay next one uh is from surya is asking about uh she's worried about um if alibaba gets delisted what will happen to my shares would i lose all its value as no one knows where the bottom is so the answer is um, two things. We've switched all of our um, shares in, in most accounts or are in the process. It takes about a week. Basically, all you have to do is call your broker and switch over. Tell them that you want to switch out from the U.S. Uh, ticker, uh, BABA, the ADS, to the Hong Kong ADRs. Some brokers will switch it over to... B-A-B-A-F, which is a U.S. OTC placeholder for the 9988, which is the Hong Kong listed shares uh, of Alibaba. Others will switch out directly for the Hong Kong listed shares, 9988, depending on your broker. Uh, and it's an eight for one uh, switch. And that's related to the currency exchange rate of the Hong Kong dollar, which is pegged. Uh, so you, the beauty of that versus, you know, having to sell BABA and then buy 9988 in Hong Kong is that there's like an hour to an hour and a half difference overnight between U.S. after hours and when Hong Kong opens, uh, effectively, uh, I think it's like 11 and a half or 12 hours later. Uh, so you don't want that hour of potential slippage. If you, if you get, uh, the, the, the word is that, that the, ADS, US ADS are fungible, meaning they're transferable back and forth uh, at an eight to one um, ratio. You get eight Hong Kong shares uh, or the BABAF for every one share. So it won't affect your basis. You're still getting the same amount of shares and, and effective ownership uh, of the business by switching out. My sense is this delisting thing is going to be a, a complete non-issue for uh, Alibaba. But the way that I explained it to clients is that there's zero penalty other than a modest uh, transfer fee uh, to the custodian. Uh, there's zero downside to do the transfer, uh, but there may be un unlimited upside. So if you, uh, even if they were to delist the Alibaba U.S. shares tomorrow, uh, because of the fungibility, you would probably just get automatically redeemed for the BABAF, that's the OTC placeholder for the, um, the 9988, uh, or you'd get the 9988 uh, shares, you know, eight for every one of the U.S. that you had, same ownership equivalency, um, automatically, because that's already set up. In the case of Didi, Didi did not have a Hong Kong ADR. So I think what they're trying to do is set up a Hong Kong listing and then figure out a way to convert the U.S. shares to the Hong Kong, just like, you know, Baba already has and some of the others. And the other re thing I said to my client is that there's no downside to doing it. And um, what we all what we want to do is if it does become a, an issue, get ahead of the institutional players that will start to shift. So uh, the MSCI 
China index, I believe, uh, converted to, I think, their Tencent and JD holdings to Hong Kong in the past couple of weeks, probably getting ahead of it. You'll probably see a little bit of that with like the K-Webs, the US ETF, that one that we covered last week that is $8 billion, uh, in in assets. Uh, some of these will probably start to shift. What you don't want to see, because they have three years, basically, to show their uh, audited financials, let the uh, PCAOB uh, review their audits. And, and while they are from big four accounting firms, in the case of Baba, uh, PricewaterhouseCoopers, et cetera, if the Chinese government says, no, we don't want you to share with that, et cetera, you don't want to be in a situation where as it gets closer to 2024, do the Hong Kong and the U.S. shares start to diverge because the U.S. shares are expected to delist, you know, at the end of 2024 because no, you know, maybe there, an agreement hasn't been reached, uh, et cetera. Whereas the Hong Kong shares would be completely unaffected because there would be no delisting risk. Uh, as there as there would be in the U.S. My sense is this is going to be a non-issue, and we've heard so much from the Chinese government uh, earlier this week. There were quite a lot of developments that we're going to get into. So uh, the way that I looked at it is there, there was zero downside to make the switch. And the other thing that's beautiful about the fungibility is we can always switch back for a modest transfer fee. I think it's like five cents a share, or flat if you have a lot of shares in which you know which we do in many accounts. I think it's a flat fee of uh, uh, $500 or something like that. But uh, to switch back is just as easy. So if it was like all clear, I, I don't know, you know, if tomorrow the U the SEC and the, you know, Chinese government said that uh, we love Alibaba being listed in the U.S., they'll never lose their listing. I, I wouldn't be in like a, a, an urgent panic to switch back. There's there's absolutely no difference. They they track exactly. The only difference would be as we move to 2024, if they started to diverge because the U, everyone was trying to get out of the U.S. shares all at once and the Hong Kong traded up to intrinsic value while the U.S. had an aberrational um, uh, divergence. But again, I, I don't really see why that would happen because at any point in time, you could just trigger the eight for one conversion into Hong Kong. So, so it's already in place. It's unlike what, what happened with uh, PetroChina and some of the ones that were linked to the Chinese government, uh, et cetera. So uh, I just want to focus on the business. I don't want to even think about that. That's why we did the transfer, not like in reaction to, oh my God, what's going to happen? Nothing's going to happen is our general view, but there's no downside to being protected against like the one one hundredth of 1% probability uh, three years out from now. So why why not do that? And then you can just focus on the business and keep adding there. And all the delisting, every time you see a delisting headline is, is an opportunity to add more to your position versus worrying about getting delisted. Uh, so great question there. Uh, Matt Mitchell, Tom, was wondering if how you factor in overall market valuations into your investment process. For example, the S&P CAPE ratio is currently right around 40 times. A level we haven't seen since the dot-com bubble, all-time average just over 17 times. Do you take a similar approach to Buffett by being agnostic to the direction of markets, the economy, and just look to buy great companies at, at prices that give you a large margin of safety? Or do you, or do overall market valuations influence your approach to allocation? As always, keep up the great work. Well, look, this is one of the key reasons that China stocks are so interesting to us uh, is they're trading at the low end of their five-year range at 12.7 times forward versus the U.S. is trading at 21 and a half times forward. So for my money, uh, I do want to take into account where where can I find value. But there are plenty of stocks that, you know, although you have this, first off, I think the CAPE ratio is crap. And the reason is, um, is, it's cyclically adjusted PE. It's like the average of earnings over 12 years, or 10 years or whatever it was. And I remember emailing the professor uh, Schiller uh, over at Yale. And I said, you know, the aberration of this is because the, the Cape had shot up, I think like two years ago or whatever it was. And I said, the aberration is in 2008, earnings were zero. And that was like a one, the earnings were negative. So it's totally skewed and, and misrepresented a much higher multiple than the reality should be because there haven't been many times in history 
uh, where earnings went negative as they did in 2008. And he acknowledged that that was correct. It, 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 it was skewed and it was aberrational. Uh, and I think that, uh, you know, you basically, if you look at the S&P 500 from 2000 to 2013, you had this basically like a uh, Great Depression period because of, uh, you know, the S&P, it, it took indices, you know, 13 some odd years to break out to new highs. And then if you look at the NASDAQ, it was much longer because the NASDAQ has crashed 80 or 90, very similar to 1930 to 1942, 1945. Uh, so I just think it's, it's, um, you know, it's okay to look at those things. The other thing is uh, Buffett indicator, market cap to GDP. I think uh, Munger had commented on it, you know, just because it were, was useful in the past doesn't mean it's useful now. I mean, market cap to GDP, when you think about all of the private companies that are worth tens of billions of dollars that can access capital in a way that they could never access capital before that don't even need to go public, um, I think if you if you added all the private unicorns, billion dollar plus startups uh, to the general that historically would have had to go public when they were 300 billion, 300 uh, million, 500 million, three billion dollar companies now 10 and 20 billion that are still private. I think you get a completely different ratio. So I, I, I don't understand that. I don't even understand the metric. Uh, it's like which index to uh, oh the Wilshire to GDP okay it's not the it's not the Russell to GDP it's not the MSCI to GDP like um, and all those indices are dynamic and again the the liquidity in the private markets and um, the rate environment you know <laughs> the, I'll go back to uh, the, that analyst the carrying cost of crazy is zero and that's that that's where we are so. Um, to answer your question, and then the other thing you look at, while the NASDAQ was crashing 90% from 2000 to 2003, value investors and small cap investors uh, had some of their best performance in history uh, during those three years while the S&P was down 50 something percent and the NASDAQ was down 80 or 90. Managers that had bought value uh, had like 20 to 30 percent years for, for three, four consecutive years while everyone else who had bought the high price to sales stocks got got absolutely slaughtered so uh i think just avoid crazy and uh look look for deep value and i and i think you'll be good good to go um but great question matt and then finally okay this is a long one but a good one from sumit kapoor uh don't know if i have time to read the whole thing but hi tom hope you're doing well and thanks for all you do for us i i sensed a bit of frustration in your voice in the last podcast towards the Fed stance on taper acceleration. So I did some analysis on whether the Fed will accelerate the taper or not. My conclusion is that there's very high probability that the Fed will announce accelerated taper during its meeting this month. Here's my analysis. So she went through the 10, uh, 12 FOMC members, seven board of governors, five Federal Reserve presidents, um, one seat currently vacant. There are only 11 FOMC members. There are Powell, Bowman, Brainerd, Clarida, Quarles, Waller, Williams, Barkin, Bostic, Daly, and Evans. And then uh, she did some analysis for each of those 12 and uh, based on their public comments and said, uh, even if Lael one of, and one of Qualls or Bowman, who are Republicans, were to switch their position, there would still be six to five in favor of taper acceleration, given this accelerated taper is on uh, given this accelerated taper is on, in my opinion, what do you think? I think you're right. I think I think the market thinks that uh, the key will be whether they parse uh, the rate hikes as distinct and 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 even go far enough to say, despite the fact we're accelerating the taper, we want to take till at least summertime to see the lagged effect of the liquidity withdrawal for those first three months. So expect no rate hikes till at least summertime. If they do that, the accelerated taper will be a non-factor. Um, if they don't do that, uh, that could be an issue, and I'll tell you why as far as the yield curve goes uh, as we get to the article of the week. Um, do you think you've, the market is priced in an accelerated taper? <sighs> Great question. Uh, I think that consensus is that it's going to happen, but the market is not behaving like that. And... I say that because of the way 
value is trading relative to growth. Yes, you've seen the high P price to sales stocks roll over. Um, here we go. Okay, so this is value to growth. The Russell 1000 value to Russell 1000 growth. It started to take off um, when they started talking accelerated taper. It corrected today. It was back up a little bit, but this is not a uh, high conviction. You know, if if they were certain that there was accelerated taper and rate hikes were going to start in March, this ratio should be like up here. It should be shooting through the roof. Cyclicals and value should be taking off like they did after the election last year. Uh, and they're not doing that yet. Maybe it's a wait and see because uh, it's such a abrupt sea change in his messaging that the market's just trying to die. Is this guy for real? What is he doing? Is he just talking down the, the long end of the curve or is he really going to do it? So um, how, should, how should we take advantage of this situation? Look, I mean, whether they accelerate the taper or not is not going to impact whether I think Boeing is cheap. Uh, whether I think uh, Alibaba is going to double over the next you know couple of years or sooner, um, whether I think uh, Lockheed Martin is a great opportunity, whether I think the drug stocks are cheap and probably going to start to uh, bounce back next year once this spending bill is put to bed. There's some drug pricing things in the spending bill that are just leaving them languishing before year end. I think you're going to see some of these AstraZeneca's, Bristol Myers. Merck's, Novartis that have all been left for dead, I think they're going to do do quite well. Um, so, so what he does doesn't really affect my outlook on the S and P 500 for the next 12 months. It, it's just going to impact which sectors outperform. And if I have my druthers, I I, I think that we are going to see uh, a pickup in the cyclicals and value um, a, as this moves ahead. So um, it's not like a what button do I have my finger on, you know, with trepidation and sweat pouring down my face based on their decision on the 15th. I really don't, I really don't care. It's not going to change much. Um, it's just a question of if they do steer the ship incorrectly, they are going to get a recession in 2023 because they're going to invert the curve next year. Uh, it's not my base case, but they could, they could in fact make that mistake and then, then we'd have problems. Uh, I don't think they're going to do that. I think it's more rhetoric and, and uh, um, the most important thing is the rate hikes versus the, the taper timeline because during the taper, whether it's three months or six months, liquidity is added to the system. The question is how much liquidity? Do you get the full 600 to 650 billion if they push it out to June or do you get you know half that if they if they rush it? And uh, it looks like we're going to get half that. But the most important thing is, can they hold the short end of the curve down quickly uh, in, in how they message it this week so that the curve re-steepens? Because right now, um, the curve is flattening very quickly. I mean, this is insane. So, you know, you get down to here where the two-year yield exceeds the 10-year yield. You've got a guaranteed recession six to 18 months after that. Um, my sense is that they do the accelerated taper and they're staunch on uh, a delay in raises. That should start to re-steepen the curve. That would be very good for uh, value in cyclicals and, um, and, and probably uh, more subdued returns for uh, tech and growth, the long duration earnings, earnings assets. So we're going to see if they can turn this around and how they do that. This is the most important uh, chart to be watching every single day because once you get down here, you got your re next recession queued up six to 18 months later uh, without fail. Uh, but we've, we've got a little room there and they've got a chance to back this up. And I, and I, my guess is they've got their eye on that. Um, okay, so we got a big bounce uh, in BABA. I think it's up uh, 14 and a half, 14.3 percent off of its l recent lows. Uh, Monday was its best day in four years. A uh, couple of things happened. One, um, they got an upgrade from City with a target of $234, implying 100 percent upside from. Monday's opening price, uh, the team at the bank said that Alibaba's valuation was justified given its dominant position in e-commerce. That's the, their $234 valuation on the uh, 
uh, U.S. ADS and many of its new businesses, which are loss making, actually have higher value than should be accounted for. Um, concerns that Chinese uh, stocks may be forced to ditch New York amid reg regulatory pressures on these companies from both Beijing and Washington may be fading. Um, and China's central bank also offered some monetary policy stimulus to start the week, cutting bank bank's cash reserve requirements. This was one of the biggest announcements. We, we've been talking about this. We anticipated this. Everyone said it wasn't going to happen. Uh, and it did happen, which is they lowered the reserve requirement ratio by 50 basis points. Again, this is in line with what we said was going to happen uh, in the 12 months ahead of the China National Congress, which is next November. They do this every single time. They crack down. They assert their authority and regulatory strength. Uh, they beat everything up uh, the year before the event. And then the 12 months going into the event, they juice it with policy stimulus uh, and they go into the transition meeting uh, from a position of strength and growth and optimism. And uh, this time it looks like it's going to be no different. They've already started the, the process exactly on schedule 12 months before. Um, so that was that. The other thing is they changed the CFO, which was viewed as a, a big positive. Um, and there's a consensus that um that um the regulatory crackdown is waning you know you had 2.8 billion earlier this year in fines the most recent fine a few weeks ago was like seventy-eight thousand dollars for a handful of in uh infractions so it came out to a few hundred grand uh and that's usually the wind down phase and i think jd and tencent got the similar similar type of uh fines uh, China markets are hot again as traders bet on more policy easing. Um, China Central Bank announced the reserve requirement ratio cut on Monday, uh, breaking free. Bank Beijing signals this week that it will provide more liquidity for banks while easing curbs on the real estate industry is stoking optimism that a long-running campaign to deleverage the economy may be coming to an end. CS300, CSI 300 capped its biggest three-day gain since mid-May on Thursday um etc etc and time for catch up china stocks have sharply underperformed their us peers this year they show the charts and these type of divergences always uh, have a tendency to converge the question is do they converge because china plays catch up and has a huge monster run or does us roll over i think it's going to be more of the china catch up than the us roll over uh, and that will be a positive thing. China shifts towards easing policy as property downturn hits growth. They released $188 billion of reserves into the banking system over the weekend. Uh, and that's related to the uh, 50, uh, 50 basis points uh, our reserve requirement ratio cut, um, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So, and, and there's more behind it. Um, more dovish statement. We think the reduction would help offset the headwinds facing the economy, particularly the first quarter of 2022. We maintain our view that, that, that an additional 50 to 100 basis points of reserve requirement ratio cut would come next year. So that would, you know, while the Fed is anticipated to increase the Fed funds rate by uh, 75 basis points, uh, we're looking at 150 basis point cuts of uh, the reserve requirement ratio over in China. So uh, while the rest of the world is in theory tightening, China is going to be loosening, just as we had said for months over the summer. If you remember, I said China made a huge mistake tightening early this year before the rest of the world was recovered. And now they're paying the price and they're going to have to reverse course. Uh, and everyone said they're not going to admit they were wrong and, and reverse. I said they're going to have no choice before the end of the year. And sure enough, right on schedule, here we are. So this is good news. This all works on a lag basis, but it's going to be a net positive and start to attract flows. Um, Chinese regulator also came out after the delisting sell off last week, says that the government policies are not necessarily linked to overseas IPOs. Chinese regulator said on Sunday, right before the open, that Beijing's recent policy moves were not aimed at specific industries or private firms and were not necessarily linked to companies seeking to list in overseas markets. So they're walking that back a bit. Again, I, I don't think anything's happening with delisting, particularly for. And then, um, the uh, we'll, we'll they finally have an answer. The future. I pay you so much money for my subscription, and you. Okay, here we go. Chinese internet ADR sell off is overdone, Citigroup says. 
Uh, DD is an isolated case, they're saying. Um, the risk of other ADR delisting could materialize by 2025, she said, noting that this would be after three consecutive years of failing to disclose mandated information starting with the 2022 annual reports. Uh, we view this sell-off as a buying opportunity for those big cap American depository shares that have dual listings in Hong Kong, she said, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And you saw the, you know, the best year in, uh, the best day in, in a long time on Monday. And we think that that's going to change, you know, so with, with it up 14%, I mean, with, with all the damage and all the fear, you know, do, does it go back and retouch it, its lows to shake out the final weak sisters before taking off? I, I don't know. I don't, I don't want to play that game. We've added down the whole way. We've got a beautiful basis now. We're excited for 2022 with the China stocks and, and uh, particularly with Alibaba. We think it's, it's, it's a home run. But, you know, you have to size it. You know, we've covered multiple times, you know, that one fund in London that did 80% of their fund in Alibaba at much higher levels. I mean, the, the number one thing in this game is if, if you buy – a handful, you know, Buffett said it perfectly. He said, if you buy a handful of stocks that are trading at below their intrinsic value, you basically can't lose money. Sooner or later, they revert back to intrinsic value and you outperform. Uh, and the key is to have the right kind of partners that in the short term, they stick with you until they get the huge alpha that comes when, when these things revert. Uh, but the, the other key is that you can't get carried out in a stretcher. No matter how high your conviction is in one idea, you have to assume that there could be things that you don't know that you don't know and it could go to zero. And you have to have a portfolio that the max risk you take on one position that the others can outperform and make up if the absolute worst case scenario happened to one company. And that's how we're set up. You know, this fund with five billion, four billion in BABA, they may not, they may wind up being right and not benefit because their partners won't stick around long enough because 80% of their fund is in it. So when, when it takes a hit like that, you know, that's, that's like monster amount to the portfolio. Whereas if you have a 10 high, high conviction, 10, 15 or 20, it makes no difference. The other positions will make up it for it in the short term. And then, you know, 12 months out, you get huge amounts of alpha from, um, from the, from the most volatile stock as the other funds are, uh, basically, uh, having forced forced liquidations, uh, you're there picking it up, slowly adding, bringing down your basis, and then when it turns, it just it just turns massively. And I think we're we're on that cusp, whether it's whether it's already happened or you get a retest and then that's it. Uh, I don't know. Don't don't really think about that. But you know, we've taken the delisting off the table by switching out to Hong Kong. We know we've got a great business, and uh, and we'll go into some of that. Um. Okay, the other thing is China's credit growth rebounds after slowing for almost a year. We talked about the credit growth impulse, how it was at that low, and now it's starting to bounce. So uh, things are falling into place there. China bond rally. Uh, okay, so they cut that. There was some announcing, well, we're going to do this now, but we, might, you know, we may not do a lot more. But you're seeing all the analysts coming out and saying it's another 50 to 100 bips next year. And that's in line with the 12 months leading into the China National Congress, which they do every time. Uh, an analyst out, uh, not an analyst, a uh, buy side um, PM. This is how to play China's tech crackdown. These are the potential winners, according to one investor. So this is an Asian guy, CEO of uh, Esoterica Capital over there. And he's basically saying that uh, Alibaba and Tencent are the key national champions investing in areas from cloud computing to semiconductors. So when you think about, um, oh, they want to crack down on tech. Yeah, they want to crack down on tech, but they also want to be, uh, they have that dual circulation. They want to be independent in um, semiconductors and AI and, uh, and cloud. And Alibaba is a leader in all of those things. So for them to become, you know, technically independent, uh, uh, Alibaba, so, so quote, here's the quote, we need companies like Alibaba, Tencent, Huawei to be there to represent the top natural technologies, um, companies representing innovations, they are still the benchmark for Chinese tech, 
uh, said that beyond their core businesses, both Alibaba and Tencent are investing in key areas of strategic priority for Beijing, including cloud computing and semiconductors. And that's the name of the game. So they're going to be generally supportive. They have um, disciplined them in a material way. And, uh, and now they're going to back off and let them do what they need them to do for the government, which is uh, Im improve their um, uh, technology as it relates to semiconductors, which, uh, as we covered a couple weeks ago, Baba came out with the uh, special chip for their cloud business. Um, and uh, and their, their cloud is growing faster than AWS. So, uh, so that's a positive thing. And they'll probably want to celebrate that going into the uh 2022 national congress um okay so that's that uh more on the uh reserve requirement ratio um okay so and there's more behind it so the pboc reiterates that liquidity will be kept reasonably ample will step up cross cyclical adjustments uh, will not resort to flood-like stimulus, will reduce capital costs for financial institutions um, by around uh, Chinese yuan, 15 billion per annum. And then the analyst came out, uh, we're in the midst of a policy shift. Uh, if we consider this cut and the one in July, there should be more to follow as this is not yet enough to counter the downward pressure. That's from the, the real estate. Uh, this is all within expectations. Uh, I expect more cuts because here's another analyst because the property situation is still unfolding and cutting interest rate is not practical given high inflation. Reserve requirement cut is the easiest and within the PBOC's control given it doesn't need to be signed off on the state council China's cabinet. A cut at this point in time can boost liquidity just in case even though the market doesn't lack liquidity and can also boost some confidence as the central bank shows its willingness to support if the bottom falls out. Um, reserve requirement ratio may have been brought forward by concerns about uh, the China Evergrande contagion risk. This is still faster than median forecast. Um, points to more uh, slowdown in economic conditions. Point to more easing, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So there's there's more behind it, and it's going to keep coming, and it's going to come strong in the next 12 months leading into the National Congress. Uh, China CSRC. This was over the weekend. Downplays overseas delisting fear after stock plunge. Uh, it respects companies' choices on where to list their stock while again denying reports of a possible ban on uh, one method of overseas stock listings. China Securities Regulatory Commission also said in a statement, reports are completely misleading that regulators are promoting firms drop their U.S. listing. Some domestic companies are actively working with Chinese and foreign uh, regulators to have their shares listed in the U.S., the agency said. So, um you know, so that so that's that. I mean, it's straight from their mouth. I know there's a little skepticism on on the official statements, but what what is their incentive to to uh, to lie? Um, okay, here's an article from Jamie Powell in uh, Financial Times. China's population is shrinking fast. Japan, 1989. Anyone? And I think this is why they have to ease up now on the regulations. I, I, they don't have the same demographic tailwind that they had. We've discussed this, uh, and these uh, these tech majors are going to be the key to to, to growth moving forward as their population rate uh, and birth rate have uh, materially declined. And keep in mind, there aren't people lined up to immigrate to China. I mean, the benefit we've had with the declining birth rate is that we've always had millions of people that wanted to come to our country. The immigration did slow a little, a little bit over the previous four years. I think that's going to pick up and our population is going to continue to grow. And we've got a beautiful de demographic tailwind with the uh, millennials larger than the boomers at an average age of 30 starting family and housing formation it drives the bus as it did from 82 to 2000 and it drives the bus as it did from 48 to 66 1948 to 66. Um, okay so uh, Chinese sees Boeing 737 MAX flying around year's end so the announcement last week was um, it was the uh, it was basically Oh, there was a word for it. So it was like the recertification, but it wasn't exactly recertification. It was the plan to recertification was the announcement when the stock jumped. Uh, they they basically, okay, so they, they've said that the planes will need to be modified and pilots will have to go through additional training before the flights and deliveries of the aircraft can, can resume. CAC official Yang told journalists, um, and they're anticipating that happens before the year end. But it's basically... Um, okay, so so what they gave was, 
watchdog had Thursday provided airlines with a list of fixes that would be required for the aircraft to be authorized to fly again. I think it was flight reauthorization or something last week, and then the recertification when they can start deliveries should be before the end of the year, which uh, they just have to meet these uh, nominal requirements, and then they're back in the game. So it's something to keep an eye on, which is helpful because they're still having, you know, 787 delivery delays and nonsense, but uh, we still love that, and, uh, and, and we're excited to see how that unfolds in the next handful of months. Um, okay, so we went through that. The reserve requirement re uh, ratio was huge. And there are more articles about this. Um, most of the analysts are coming in here on the recertification, on the back of that authorization announcement and with uh, the recertification coming, they're coming in. Uh, Herbert rates Boeing stock and outperform with the 275 price target. Uh, shares have been beaten up by the max lows in COVID-19. Uh, yeah, so I mean, basically, look, the after the max recertification, 787 deliveries up uh, next on the on the catalyst front, and that'll probably be early to mid Q1. Um, but if you just step back, look. Uh, are everything else that has is in the normal course of business, much of it is returned to pre-pandemic levels or greater. We even saw the TSA pass-through numbers over Thanksgiving get up to $2.4 million, uh, 2 .4 million people on that Sunday. Uh, so you have to just sit back and say, are there going to be more people flying uh, a year from now, two years from now than flew in 2019 and i think the answer is resoundingly yes and yet boeing is still you know 57 percent off of its pre-pandemic highs huge backlogs huge increase in middle class uh and, and they still operate in a duopoly so uh this is a great story and the catalysts are just slowly unfolding and that's that's the story there uh the uh evergrand default uh that's just a slow motion we've covered that before the government's going to ring fence it and break it up uh, this, I just put together a PDF with uh, all of the Alibaba that research that we've done over the year, uh, the last, uh, you know, couple of months that we've put out, um, and went through this, the key themes, which we've covered a lot of them, but I think it is timely. By the way, if you're on the podcast, we're going to get cut off shortly. Just go to hedgefundtips.com. Click on the video cast. It's a YouTube video. Fast forward to minute 60 and you'll pick up word for word exactly where you left off. Um, but the, the basic thing is, you know, the, here's the Baba chart. It's fallen back to this breakout level from 2017. You can buy it at 2017 prices. The difference is that revenues gro have grown by 350% and cash flow and EPS have doubled over the same period and are going to double over the next couple of years as well. Um, and that, that opportunity doesn't come around. So like when I see something like that, so what are the risks, the delisting risk? Well, that's off the table now. We own Hong Kong shares. Um, continued regulatory crackdown and fines, they, they keep getting less and less and less, uh, et cetera. So, uh, so we like that. And despite the persistent government regulatory crackdown that ensued since the beginning of 2021 through this fall, Alibaba was able to grow revenues 38.4% year on year in its most recent quarter. This exceeded the top line growth in the same quarter last year, which was plus 32%, and the year before, which was plus 35%. So you're getting like such a massive growth stock uh, with a huge moat around their business for, um, uh, for a uh, below market multiple, you know, 13 times next year's earnings. It's just unheard of and that's just because of the short-term fear and the deleveraging etc uh other thing to keep in mind um is that the earnings miss last quarter was largely attributable to alibaba's holdings in chinese public securities and all chinese stocks went down from august through uh, November due to the crackdown and they held quite a bit and that impacted their bottom line. We believe that for the most part, excluding some of the education stocks, that most of this uh, short-term impairment will be temporary and the earnings will come back uh, meaningfully. 
the earnings multiple on Baba has contracted from an average of 28 times since inception to 13 times next year's estimates. The current price to sales ratio is 2.7 times, which is below its five year average of 10.2 times. For context, the S&P, which grows much slower, uh, is trading at 21 and a half times earnings and three times sales, 3.1 times sales. Amazon's trading at uh, four times sales and 69 times earnings. And Google's trading at three times sales and 26 times earnings and they're growing much more slowly. They're much more mature companies. I mean, where AliCloud is relative to where AWS, it's just staggering the growth runway they have and the growth that they're having outside, both in China and outside of China. So 1.2 billion users with a plan to exceed 2 billion. It's not a franchise that's easily replicated or duplicated, uh, and their cloud business is growing faster than AWS. Alibaba is the crown jewel of China. Um, and it's interesting. Um, a heavy weighting both in the emerging market indices as well as MSCI China. To get BABA right, you have to get China right. As abrupt and severe as the 2021 regulatory crackdown and downturn has been, it is actually a regular occurrence that happens every three to four years. The CCP feels like they're losing grip on power. Then they crack down to assert their authority from a position of weakness. Next, they overshoot on the crackdown, leading to a slowing economy, which we've seen increased unemployment and fear or act, fear of or actual social unrest. They've had a mix of it. And then they ultimately relent by instituting financial stimulus, loosening regulation, and easing monetary policy. Here's what it looks like and how it resolves. And here's how it happens basically every three to four years, like clockwork, 30, 35 to 40% drawdown in the general indices, uh, followed by monster recoveries and new highs over the ensuing years. Uh, the average return post market trough in previous corrections when it goes from despair to growth is 31 percent um, in, the, in the subsequent 12 months. That's for the indices. That basically means you're going to see individual stocks up 30, 50, even 100 percent plus over the next 12 months. And uh, this shows the average returns in the 12 months leading up to the Nat China National Congress. Uh, which is next November, uh, 11 months from now, on average, it's 30%. So this normal re uh, response of 31% could be accelerated by the uh, average 30% leading into the China National Congress. Um, and uh, right now, opinion could not be more bearish or despondent. People are being scared out of their, out of their holdings left and right. We're buyers at these levels for sure. And... Um, the belief that evaluations could be recover is predicated on four points. Uh, the easing, which started, China will need to ease policy to rein in systemic risk. That actually came true this weekend. They did the 50 basis point cuts before everyone thought we'd been anticipating it. It finally came. That released $188 billion of liquidity. The 20th National Congress, we, we covered. The potential for regulation, clarity, and intensity to improve. Uh, that started to happen. You're seeing the regulatory episodes roll over, according to this table from Goldman Sachs. Uh, prevailing valuations, it's trading at 12, uh, uh, their indices are trading at 12.7 times, which is the lower bound of the five-year range. And China's valuation discounts to global equities are at almost all-time highs. The re-rating upside could be amplified the close, by the close to record low allocation by global mutual funds on average are 470 basis points below their benchmark. So when these go, they're going to have to chase up quickly, just like they had to chase up quickly to get overweight energy this year as the top performer in the U.S. So uh, emerging markets are trading at the greatest bargain relative to the S&P 500 in the last 20 years. This is emerging, uh, and uh, we know what happened in 2002 to 2007. China is the largest weighting in the emerging markets indices, making up almost 40%. So as this ratio turns, China is going to be the greatest beneficiary. Uh, in the re most recent global fund manager survey, uh, 300 managers overseeing a trillion voted that emerging markets would be the top performer in 2022. We agree and are aggressively positioned uh, with one of the top weights in the indices. That was the survey. Um, uh, while big sell side firms debate whether the S&P is going to be up 9% or down 5% next year, avoid the noise, look under the surface and find the bargains wherever they may be domiciled, in this case Hong Kong. Uh, the end of the year selling pressure in laggard names is in the rearview mirror for institutional managers and nearing its climax for retail tax loss selling, which is early December. So that's a, that's a constructive tailwind we should see uh, or and are starting to see. 
And you can see in this month's fund manager survey that while uh, institutions are still dramatically underweight emerging markets, second only to bonds, they did start to add emerging markets allocation last month. This is in line with uh, Exhibit 2. They, they got done selling their laggards in early October. So uh, see, see how underweight they are but they're starting to add and that's going to just we'll probably see tomorrow if they if it's not no it will probably be next Tuesday the uh December survey and we'll probably see emerging markets bump up here a little bit and this underweight uh start to move towards uh towards overweight uh we know that uh Munger doubled down and um and this is just a visual of earnings revenue and earnings estimates uh, for BABA, you know, you just look, you're paying for when revenues were here, we're paying the same price as where they are here. You look at earnings, so they slowed down in this calendar year, they're going to resume the uptrend and they're going to be double um, what they were last year. They're going to be double in a handful of years uh, after doubling. So, uh, and you're paying the prices back here. So you're going to basically get this and this and you're going to pay for this and this and it, you know that is the formula for consistent winning when you buy a handful of those type of stocks you basically can't lose money over time and that's that's how uh munger and buffett built their careers um so if i can buy a business that's expected to double in the next few years pay the same price as someone who bought it four years ago when it was producing of what uh one third of what it is today what could go wrong why is it so underpriced the market's concerned the china's government will continue to regulate it to a point that its future earnings power is permanently impaired. We believe this fear is overblown because it would destroy China's global competitiveness, discourage citizens from having children in an economy with less opportunity and lead to significant unemployment. And the second one is the delisting risk, which we already covered. It's not an issue till 2024 slash 2025. And, uh, and we think it's not an issue at all because the ADSs are fungible and you can exchange them out at any time. Uh, so it's, it's an eight to one exchange and, uh, there's no real downside to doing it. I don't think there's a rush to do it, but, uh, you know, it certainly doesn't ha hurt, hurt to do it. Uh, we pulled up a couple random Barron's articles on some of the, uh, pharma stocks that we think are going to start to pick up next year. Bristol is too cheap. Um, AstraZeneca, Novartis, so so they're starting to get it, and Barron's usually gets it right on most of these things. You got to learn which authors are better than others, uh, but um, obviously the market showed some buoyancy. The Pfizer vaccine, as we anticipated, does work if you add the third booster against um, uh, against uh, Omicron. I talked to someone in London today. And he was saying that, you know, he he knew a bunch of people that got it. It, it. it basically comes on quickly and goes away quickly, and it's it's relatively mild. So that, that's been the case, as we see in the hospital numbers, didn't really push up, uh, nor did the mortality numbers push up in, in South Africa and other areas where they have concentrated uh, amounts of it. Um, okay, uh, Raytheon announces a $6 billion buyback program. Again, that's going back to industrials and um anything aerospace related um along the lines of lockheed along the lines of boeing which we've been uh mentioning quite a bit chair powell a chance to be a hero or a zero and last week in the this is our article of the week and then we're going to wind it up uh last week in the midst of the omicron accelerated taper fears sell-off we suggested the market was due for a bounce the indicators we pointed to are as follows um, we showed all of these. This was the VIX was elevated. The uh, advanced decline volume on the uh, New York Stock Exchange was at levels where it basically always bounces. New York, uh, the NYSE McClellan Oscillator, the S&P bullish percent, the NASDAQ advanced decline issues, the NASDAQ McClellan Oscillator was at these levels where it always bounces, uh, the NASDAQ McClellan Summation Index, the NASDAQ advanced decline volume, NAS and NYSE advanced decline issues, the PMO by all, uh, which is still at zero, by the way, the PMO by uh, DJI. These, again, are all levels where you get these bounces. And sure enough, we got a 4.36% per per bounce from the, the night we put it out, Wednesday night, uh, we put out the article, and, um, and that's what happened. 
On Thursday morning, I went on Cheddar with Brad Smith to discuss the Fed accelerating taper and what stocks we are buying on weakness. Um, now, last week I suggested that Chair Powell take a breather on his rush to speed up the taper. Our primary reasoning was that most of the commodity basket was rolling over for the past few months. You can click here to see all the charts and will be felt by the consumer on a lag basis three to five months out. Supply chain backlogs have started to ease in some pockets like semiconductors somewhat faster than expected. And this was an interview on CNBC yesterday that Carl Quintanilla put out. The number of ships uh, at anchor is now down to 35. That's about a 60% reduction in just the past six weeks alone. We also saw the November jobs report. The uh, average hourly earnings came in on a month on month and year on year basis below expectations. Uh, so um, we're going to see the CPI and the course uh, CPE tomorrow to, to check the inflation numbers, but they're backward looking. So I'm less interested, but they will have an impact on the Fed's decision next week. Um, the other thing is the Fed has not reached their mandate. They're, remember, they have a dual mandate, price stability and full employment. They've not reached full employment as there's still 6.9 million people unemployed. This compares to 5.7 million pre-pandemic or a dis difference of 1.2 million more people still unemployed with commodity prices weakening in recent weeks and months and 1.2 million people still structurally unemployed. The idea of speeding up taper seems hasty and imprudent, but they're probably going to do it anyway. The market's now pricing in an accelerated taper uh, ending in March versus June and three rate hikes uh, in total before the end of 2022. What's confusing about the response is, is that the market is not behaving, at, behaving as if this accelerated taper and rate hikes are a foregone conclusion. If it was clear that bond buying would end in March and rate, rate hikes would commence shortly thereafter, cyclicals and value should be dramatically outperforming and long duration earnings, assets, tech and growth should be selling off more meaningfully. This has started to happen, particularly with high prices sales, multiple stocks, but not in a convincing manner as of yet. Uh, without replicating the 13 charts above, we can look at a few below to see that despite the 4.3% bounce, many of the indicators have barely come off the mat. This is more, there is more room to run after some fits and starts and consolidation. We got a little bit of that today, likely related to Fed anticipation and outcome in the coming weeks. Uh, and here are some of the sectors. Financials have come down quite a bit from an area that they tend to bounce. Uh, healthcare, we still love Cigna here. And, and now uh, some of these drug stocks going into 2022 uh, that have been beaten down and, and biotech as well, selected biotech, industrials. And I think it's part of the holdup is in the spending bill there's some type of drug pricing uh language that you know invariably gets worked out before they they wind up getting anything through if they do get anything at all through and, and then the group takes off so that that's a catalyst to be looking for in, in coming weeks depending on senator mansion uh industrials again down here we think you know with the 32 percent earnings growth and many of them looking uh really beat down that's an opportunity staples are cheap uh, we'll see how they do in 2022, but there's some opportunity there. And then these are the general indices. These are still at points where you want to be a buyer, not a seller, even after the recent 4.5% bounce, uh, 4.3, and a little consolidation today by SPX, by the uh, bullish percent S&P. These are all bounce levels. Uh, VIX is rolling over. The put call ratio is rolling over. Earnings estimates creeped up again next week to two, uh, last week to 222 and change. This is going to be 230 plus. I don't know if it's going to be before the end of the year. Uh, that's my bet, but maybe it's maybe it's early January. But we're going to see these are too low. Plus, you've got a trillion in authorized buybacks, which will help that, et cetera. These shows the sectoral earnings. Industrials will be the fastest growing, followed by consumer discretionary and energy. Infotech will be slightly better than the S&P at 9.6 versus 8.8, .8, but nowhere in comparison to industrials. This is not yet reflected in, in the price of most industrials. We think there's a major opportunity in this sector in 2022, and I've discussed several names like Boeing, Lockheed Martin, some of the airlines, et cetera. Now onto the shorter term general market. Uh, bullishness came up a little bit off the mat from 26 to 29, but still a lot of skepticism. Uh, you can see here, fear and greed was at 39. That's still uh, a lot of fear in the market, so a lot of uh, potential upside. It's just turning. The National Association of Active Investment Managers actually today they print it. It uh, it shook last week shook a lot of active managers out of their stocks down to seventy percent from over a hundred. So they're going to have to chase in the year end if we continue with the, this follow through. 
Um, and then uh, this is the most important part of the, the thing. While we've made it clear that an accelerated taper is not needed at present with wage increases slowing, commodities weaken, and the supply chain loosening up, it seems probable at this point that Powell will bow to the pressure as he did in 20, December 2018, which was a huge mistake. If you remember the worst depre uh, uh, December since the Great Depression, caused a, I think it was like a 25% overall correction from the October highs. Uh, completely unnecessary it was tightening into weakening data the most likely consequence will be that the 1.2 million structurally unemployed people will get left in the dust if he follows through with his plan and even as prices rise modestly in the short term maybe we get a little hotter number tomorrow they will normalize in a few months time and at that point we'll see if the fed listens to the data and holds off on the rate hikes until at least summertime for those of you reading this who interact with the Fed, I'd suggest you remind this, uh, them of this important chart. This is the most important chart in the game. The yield curve 210 spread, and it's headed towards zero, which guarantees a recession. They can reverse course based on their actions, uh, not only next week, but also uh, in coming months as it relates to rate hikes. The yield curve is flattening quickly, and if they accelerate taper and then hike rates too quickly, they'll invert the curve. The two-year two yield will be greater than the 10-year yield. Once that happens, a bear market and recession in the following 6 to 18 months is inevitable as credit is choked off and the economy grinds to a halt. This is not our base case, but has a reasonable probability if Powell steers the ship inc incorrectly. Powell needs to show a spine and not sus succumb to backward-looking pressure. Move ahead with the taper at the original, original reasonable pace, but push off rate hikes as long as possible. If you re-steepen the curve, those 1.2 million people will be back to work in 2022. If you fold to the backward looking pressure and data, you'll have a recession by 2023 and few bullets left to solve it. Zero or hero, it's your choice. That's the title of the article, by the way, Chair Powell, chance to be a hero or a zero. And that's gonna depend on how he steers the ship. Our base case is still high single digit to low double digit returns for the S&P 500 in 2022 with greater volatility than 2021. Fed policy will largely determine which sectors outperform versus underperform as rates determine everything. We've used the short-term volatility to buy and add high quality franchises that will grow over six to 12 months despite policy and virus surprises along the way. We do it steadily, methodically on down days and not all at once. So that's that. Economic data this week was uh, pretty good. Um, the uh, job openings were huge. They came in at 11 million versus uh, 10.3 million expectations. Uh, crude oil draw was uh, 250,000 barrels versus negative uh, 1.7 million estimated. Um, and what else? Uh, continuing claims was weak, so that's not good. But initial jobless claims came in at like a, uh, one of the lowest levels since uh, 1969 at 184,000 versus 215,000 estimated. So that was a good number. And uh, that's the story. So the name of the game is the CPI and core CPE tomorrow. Uh, I'm sorry, core CPI is expected to come in at 4.9% uh, year on year. CPI, that's X food and energy. CPI is expected to come in at plus 6.8. So these are pretty high expectations. I think you could see them come. I'll take the under, but I, I, I'm agnostic either way. Uh, if it was meaningfully under, that might affect their decision next week, which would have a material impact on the market. So uh, tomorrow morning at 8.30 is probably a pretty important time to be paying attention. And with that said, I uh, want to thank you for listening in. The last couple of weeks have been uh, on the shorter side, around 45 minutes. This week we went a little over, but a lot of developments had happened with regard to some major themes that we've been uh, pressing on the last uh, month or two. So with that said, thanks for tuning in. We'll be back next week, same time, same place. In the meantime, make it a great one.